Hey, it's Saoirse. It feels like it's been a while since I did a, like, single book video, but it really hasn't been that long. I've just been losing my mind trying to figure out how to edit videos together because that's just not something that I do. So the, for the past couple ones I had to do that. And I hope you enjoyed them even though they were a little choppy. But today I'm going to talk about At Home in the World. This is by Joyce Maynard. Can you see it? Um, so I got this at the Festival of Reading, and I've actually met Joyce there a couple times now, because she'll come to the festival and she does like a reading from her work, and then she signs books after. So she signed this for me, and it's so cute. For Saoirse, shamelessly, because that's, here I'll explain that, now write yours, and she does a little picture. Courage sounds like you have it. Because I talked to her about hiking the trail and stuff, and um, she's so nice. So she has been kind of slammed by critics um, for some of her work, and they've called her shameless. So I just love that. Like, yeah, I'm shameless. I'm gonna write, you know, my life story, and nobody's gonna tell me that I can't. So because here's the thing, she had a relationship with J.D. Salinger. So that is what people always associate her with, and um, a lot of this book deals with that relationship. Um, and so she got a lot of crap for writing it, because big Salinger fans were like, how could you? How could you expose his life? And he's such a private person, how dare you? How dare you? You know, it's her story. It's the things that he did to her, you know, he had, he had the choice to not do those things to her and not exploit her as an 18 year old when he was 53. I still love Catcher in the Rye, but I've got quite a, a different view of J.D. Salinger now. Um, so she went to Yale, Joyce went to Yale when she was 18, and she wrote this article um, for what was it for? The New York Times Magazine. And it was called An 18 Year Old Looks Back on Life. And Salinger saw it and he started writing her letters. So he wrote her all the time and they became like really close through these letters. And eventually it escalated to the point that they met and they had a relationship for almost a year. And all that time he spent like really I mean you know you're 18 you're pretty impressionable he was mentally manipulating her and trying to make her something she wasn't telling her that you know she wasn't writing authentically enough that because she wanted to publish things and be known for her work and be proud of her work that like somehow she wasn't a good writer you know like because everybody has to just live in their little cave and never talk to the world in order to be a good writer. Which is so not true, and especially now you have to really promote yourself, you have to get out there and, and sell your stories or nobody's gonna know that they're there. It's just, it's not, it's not the old days anymore when it comes to publishing. And you know, this was taking place I think in the 70s. Um, so yeah, very different time even then, you know, as opposed to when Salinger published Catcher in the Rye. That was already a while ago then. And he was just living in the past and also kind of seemed just like not the nicest person. <laughs> like in the beginning he was so nice and complimentary and then he just turned into something else when they were together. So eventually he brought her to Florida um, with his kids and he told her go back, go back to, I think it's New Hampshire, and get your stuff out of my house. Bye. And that's it. Um, and it was really sad and, you know, something that any of us who has been through a horrible breakup can understand and relate to. But more than the, whole, the story about Salinger in this book is the story about her life and uh, her childhood and, you know, moving past 
the hardships that she faced to become her own woman and, you know, a really successful, impressive woman, I think. So this is, yeah, this is one of her memoirs. She's written more than one memoir. Um, what do I want to say? So what I admire about, about this book is that she's so honest. Um, Joyce does not hold anything back, like, she really gives you the gory details about her life, and something that she says when she does her talks, um, she recommends to other writers to write like an orphan, which means don't worry so much about the people that are going to be reading this, the people that you might hurt in your family, you have the right to tell your story. Anything bad that somebody has done to you, you don't have to protect them by not telling anybody about it ever. If they did that thing to you and it's made you a certain way, you have every right to talk about it. So the good and the bad, you know, if it's happened in your life, it is your story. And no publisher, no critics, nobody can tell you that you, you can't write about it. Guess what? It's your property. It's your life. So she really gets into it um, and talks about her family, but she also like makes sure that she says you know, no matter how much her parents might have affected her negatively, she loves them very much and is grateful for the good things that they did um, because she grew up with an alcoholic father and, you know, in spite of all that, she does love him and she forgives her parents for what they did. Um, it's just like any family, just really complicated relationships with parents and siblings and all that. And then eventually in the book she gets into being a mother and... Um, the issues that that brings too, and she talks about how her kids, um, one of her kids read the book and there were all these reviews online and people saying like, how could you write about these things that have happened to you knowing that your children might read this? And her son actually responded to that person saying like, look, I read it, I think it's great, and blah blah blah. So everybody is a critic and everybody's going to judge you for everything that you do and it's ridiculous and it's sad and we should all just worry about ourselves. but. Joyce has just proven that she doesn't, not that she doesn't care, but that she's still going to go on and be herself, and she's not going to apologize for it, and I love her for it. Um, so I think that's the most important thing when you're writing a memoir, you have to be so honest. And um, I'm a little behind on my reading this month, but I am reading One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and I started Eat, Pray, Love at the same time, and so I'll get into this with Eat, Pray, Love, but that memoir does not feel as honest to me as this one because Joyce just gives you so much about her life and she doesn't hold back. So when I read memoirs that are like wanting to brush past the, the really bad stuff and just get to like the fun part of the story or, or you know like try to show you the lesson without giving you the reason why they needed the lesson, it doesn't really work. And as somebody who writes memoirs, I really, really admire Joyce and her ability to you know, not show just the things that people have done to her, but also, like, some of the things that she's done, maybe that she's not proud of. Um, it's just so important, because you have the right to tell your story, but you have to tell it honestly, or there's really no value in it. It's not even a memoir anymore at that point. Don't make things up, and don't, don't brush over things, and don't hide stuff that isn't, or that is relevant to the story, but that you just don't want to tell. And I know how excruciating that is. Like, it's very hard for me to write certain things that I have written about my life. It's very, very hard. And you think the whole time, like, you're so anxious at the keyboard thinking, like, okay, this person's going to read that and they're going to hate me. But guess what? You have the right to do it. So anyway, get off my soapbox. And um, I want to read you a few quotes in here. Um, I like this one. She says, like, her parents were both big writers and... Um, her mother, okay, her mother says, or no, she says, my mother schools me young to view my writing as valuable. She conveys another lesson too. Whatever happens in my life, I can look at it as material. And I really relate to that because in almost in like a not so good way, like a detached way, I have things happen to me and I, they might be terrible. And I just think, well, there's something to write about. Like, that sucked, but at least now I have a story, and if everything goes perfectly in my life, I'll have no story, and nobody will want to read about just a perfect, wonderful life. You know, people like um, hearing about catastrophes. So, 
Yeah, I liked that. Everything is material. I always tell people too, like, you know, I've, I'm on my fourth book, writing my fourth book, and I tell people who tell me like, oh, I can't believe you're able to do that. Everybody has a story. Everyone. And I hear, I hear stories from people all the time, like they'll tell me about a trip they took or something that happened that really changed them. And I'm like, why don't you write about that? Write it. You could literally get a whole book out of that. All right, Caddy. Excuse me. Excuse me. Thank you. Another one. Um, For 18 years, I have lived in terror of leaving my parents and yet dreamed of making my escape. I have run to my mother's bed and my father's studio. At the same time, I kept wishing for another safer home. I love that because I've spent a lot of time going, you know, back and forth from like living on my own, living abroad, coming back home and living and never really feeling like I knew where I wanted to be or feeling like I knew what the, what the right thing for me to be doing is. Um, and it's comforting to be with your family, but then you also just, you need to spread your wings and get away. You really eventually need to leave the nest. I'm sorry for all the, bo- the bird metaphors. I cannot help it. That's just the way it is. But anyway. Um, hmm. I don't know if I wanted to do that one. Give me a second. Maybe I do. I'll just read this. She says, What I see in Jerry Salinger, and this is far more significant for me than his literary celebrity, is the possibility that there might be another human being on the planet in whose presence I won't need to conceal my true identity. What's the desire of a boy to kiss me or have sex with me compared to the extraordinary sense of relief and comfort of finding a fellow human being who recognizes and embraces me like a long-lost countryman? It's not his fame as a writer that draws me to him. It's his voice. Eventually I will come to love his voice on the phone, his voice in the room with me. But what I love first is his voice on the page. And I just like that. I don't feel like I need to explain why I like every quote, but, you know, you can draw your own conclusions. It is unfathomable to me at 18 that some people actually grow up feeling reasonably content with themselves. It will be years before I understand some people go to bed every night with a sense of well-being that has nothing to do with winning prizes or publishing their stories. That really hit me because I've never felt like I've done anything like big enough to prove myself to, to myself, to the world, anybody, like to kind of justify why I, why I even exist, you know? And she talks about that a lot, how she, since she was a child, has felt like she really needs to make something of herself, like make a name for herself with her writing. Um, otherwise, you know, she'll just die being unaccomplished, and I have that freak out all the time. Like, I haven't done anything, and I'm getting older every year, and it's scary. So I love how honest she is about that. Hmm. So this is where she's with... Salinger, and um, I think they're talking about jazz, and um, Joyce is saying, I wish instead of writing that I could play an instrument, it seems so much more real than putting words on paper, so much more genuinely expressive and emotionally powerful. Nothing I've ever written could make a person feel as excited as a piece of great music. What I do seems dry by comparison. Listen, Jerry tells me, looking away from the road and straight into my eyes for a moment. Don't ever suppose it's some kind of lesser art form you're engaged in because nobody's lined up outside some goddamn smoke-filled club full of people in turtlenecks, waiting to hear you transport them into some orbit of pure ecstasy. I like that. Um, because, yeah, writing is a very different thing, and I... I feel that so personally because I don't do any kind of other kind of like art, you know. I mean, I've danced and stuff, but I've never been great. Um, I've never been really great at anything artistic other than writing. And well, I wouldn't even say I'm great, but like I, I continue with it. Um, and it's not some grand, exciting thing, you know. It's this subtle art form that you need to use your brain for. It's not like you have a you see a picture and you have an immediate emotional response to it. Like, you have to actually read and use your eyeballs and your brain at the same time. Um, 
She says, I don't know much about jazz. I was just thinking it looked like so much more fun than what I do. And he says, fun, not much fun in writing. I'll grant you that. No notes on a page for us to fall back on. No amazing orgasmic rhythms to make the audience melt. No heroism that anyone is likely to detect. Not one goddamn thing to do with the body except to try wherever possible to ignore one's own cursed immobility. God, the unnaturalness of writing. And unlike performing music, it never gets any easier no matter how much you do it. Every damn time we sit down to work, it's that same blank page again. True. I've got to finish this video before 25 minutes because then I'll have to edit stuff again. I don't want to do it. Um, Okay, so she's like getting successful, but then she, you know, she feels pulled in different directions, and I relate to this. She says, approval and praise from the managing editor of the New York Times is an intoxicating thing, but what I really want is to have a normal life, a normal regular life with children, a garden, and a dog. I want to live in my house in New Hampshire, eating three meals a day and sleeping in the arms of a man who will not leave. There is so much I believed in once that I don't believe in anymore. See, not everybody wants to be just a housewife or just famous like you can want everything and that's the that's the tough thing about being somebody like me who just wants to have it all that's not easy to come by where am i looking here oh i got my little notes and they're telling me the page numbers i just can't pay attention Okay, um, I don't know who said this, but she says, speaking of Salinger, someone says, it wasn't a sexual power, it was a mental power. You felt he had the power to imprison someone mentally. It was as if one's mind were at risk rather than one's virtue. And you gotta watch out for that, because some people will try to mentally imprison you, and um, will be totally selfish with your emotional and mental health. Um, it sounds like Salinger really did that and he did it to a lot of young women. Not just her, which she found out. And this is, uh, this is just the last one, a little quote from her article that they included at the end of the book here, An 18 Year Old Looks Back on Life. Um, and she's talking about, like, what's it, what is it like to be a teenager in this time, you know, 60s and 70s. Um, drugs took on a disproportionate importance. Why was it I could spend half a dozen evenings with someone without his ever asking me what I thought of Beethoven or Picasso, but always, in the first half hour, he'd ask whether I smoked? And that really, that really resonated with me, because why is that the most important thing? Why does everybody just want to talk about drugs and drinking and not art and literature and travel and the important things and not things that just that we just use to numb and distract ourselves because guess what look at all these things I use to numb and distract myself that aren't hurting my brain and body I don't know I mean these aren't just for distraction I genuinely love stories but yeah that's all I'll say about that and so to finish up um, I'll say when I like I was saying before about being honest when you write memoirs, so like when I write my own memoirs, I have such a fear of being so open and vulnerable, but being honest is the only way I know how to be. Um, and maybe it's why I've never been too popular, but I just can't fake anything for anyone. I can't. So I'm, I'm really an open book in my normal life, just meeting people, not, not just in writing. Um, you can ask me anything and I'm not going to sugarcoat anything for you um, and maybe some people think that's a flaw but I really wish that everybody was just more honest because I think it would be a better world um, so I hope you know the writing that I do inspires people to be more honest in their lives and with themselves and feel that they have the right to to stand up for themselves to tell their story and you know to tell the, the real side of it you know because somebody can take your story and they can tell their version of it and it's completely skewed and it's frustrating when people believe that so you really need to get out there and you need to tell your life story and be honest about it and don't be ashamed of it 
everybody's got things that they're not proud of. But, you know, the more willing you are to share those things, I think the healthier you become. And the more you're opening yourself up to a better future. I don't know. But anyway, um, so the exciting news is that next month, um, for 10-ish days in March, I am going uh, to Guatemala to attend Joyce Maynard's memoir writing workshop. So she does this every year and um, she chooses um, some of the, it's all women, she chooses people who apply for her um, workshop and she chose both my mother and I, so we get to go together, which is gonna be interesting and exciting. Um, so what's gonna happen is she'll like, we'll get together with all the other women in Joyce and um, we'll have our work read by, like we'll read the other women's work and Joyce will read our work and she'll workshop it and help us improve our memoir writing. Caddy, come on baby. Why, why can't you just sit, just sit here with me? Um, so I'm looking to learn a lot from her because I mean, this was really good. Like, I'm not just saying that because I like her as a person or because I'm going to her workshop, but I really enjoyed her memoir. It was, I mean, it's just, it's her life. And you think, you know, oh, what, what's, what's so interesting about one woman's life? Um, it was just well done and riveting and, and so brutally honest that you really wanted to keep reading. And I read it pretty fast. So I'm hoping that she can teach me a lot about how to make my my own memoir writing better and I'm looking forward to it a lot and I think it's gonna be such a beautiful place it's on this giant lake with like mountains and volcanoes and stuff so it'll be pretty unreal um, but yeah I just wanted to share that exciting news um, and I think that's about it so next time I I know I said I was gonna talk about one flew over the cuckoo's nest <laughs> I'm just struggling with it right now, and so I'm, like I said, I'm reading Eat, Pray, Love, too, so I'm going to talk about one of those two things next, and I hope you enjoyed the book haul in the last video. Oh, one second. I was going to show you something. I totally forgot to show these in the last video, but I did also, as part of the 18 book book haul, where I only showed 16 of them, I got Lolita. Okay. Um, and we kind of know what that's about. This professor's obsessive, devouring, and doomed passion for this younger girl. And then I got Naked Lunch, uh, which I think was on the perks of being a wallflower list of reading. One of the most important novels of the 20th century, redefined literature. Startling tale of a narcotics addict unmoored in New York. Blah blah blah, I'm not gonna read all of it. Um, but, yeah. Because these are the ones I had to return because they were all ripped up and I got them exchanged and then I forgot they were on the shelf over there and not in the boxes. So sorry about that. So looking forward to talking next time about whichever book um, I choose to finish first. And thanks for watching. Say bye, Caddy. Bye bye.